Jesus Christ. It is so good to see you all. Um, when we drove up, the parking lot was so full, and now that I look at your faces, everyone must have drove a separate car. <laughs> it is good to be here in God's house, to be in worship with you. I'm excited about these last several Sundays um, as we walk through a very meaningful sermon series together. I'm trusting the story. I hope that Last week, I um, blessed you as you listened to that. I look forward to sharing further with you this week. So let's prepare ourselves for worship, and I want to invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this day that you have given us. Lord, we have woke up with, with breath in our lungs, with blood coursing through our veins. Lord, we thank you for this life that you have gifted us today. Lord, help us to live this life every day, but especially this day as a gift. Lord, as we celebrate, as we worship, be in our midst, Lord. May your Holy Spirit reign in this time. Lord, convict us of our sin. Deliver us from our slavery to sin and death. Make us a new creation in you, O oh God. We trust you. We praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
liturgy. Generous God, you gave us our voices, no two the same. As you did with Abraham and Sarah, you touch our lives, and they can become extraordinary. In your church, you have gathered us. In your community of ordinary folk and complainers, prophets and puzzled people, you have called us and made a place for us. So let what we say and do here, what we ponder and decide here, be real for us and honest to you as you prepare us for the life of the world in which you are praised. Amen. <laughs> Exactly. 
this morning, since we're having a party this afternoon and we're inviting the South Africans, I asked Miss Anne Marie if she would teach y'all how to count to five in her language, which is called Afrikaans. I know a little You know something? Okay, tell us. Oh no, that's not accurate. <laughs> <laughs> that's Spanish. <laughs> okay, Miss Anne Marie, how do you say one? Joyce Summer. 
Thornhill, Ned Young, Beverly Hopper, Ron Jackson, James Jackson, Dini Duffel Schaefer, Lauren Jackson Garner, Billy Smith, Rebecca Ferguson, Jared Lee, Russell Lee, Courtney Turner, Lanny Travis, Brenda Woodyard, Ashlyn Lundquist, Sue Burgess, Linda McDay, Alex, Patrick, and Rachel Lee, Ann McFarland, Stephen Jones, Zach Miller, Johnny Turner, Bill Brown, Robert Dennis, Dale Tyner, Dale Webster, Laurel Coker Catlett, Sherry Lynn Kimmer, the family of Ted Stingley Sr., the family of Sally Bedford, the family of Kelly Duncan, Charles and Catherine Harris Grandar, and our continued prayer list. Are there any other prayers of concern? Um, I have one for my husband Richard. He and three of his employees are driving up to Ashley, Indiana to kind of help them out of a bind. So if y'all could keep them in their prayers for <coughs> safe travels there and back. Um, no other prayers of concern? Prayers of Thanksgiving. Steve Chastain got approved for a liver and kidney transplant. Mary and Sherry gave <coughs> reunions for the flower bed. The youth had a good trip Friday. Addison Polk was not hurt in a wreck. Are there any other prayers of Thanksgiving? We were home for our hot water heater. <laughs> Mine was home and our hot water heater flew. spoken on the list. I want to invite you to pray with me. Holy God, it's with awe, reverence, and humility that we enter into this moment of prayer together. Lord, we join our hearts around a common voice, lifting up the name of Jesus. Lord, because in the name of Jesus, all things are made new. Through the power of your Spirit, Lord, you have made us, you have called us to follow you. Lord, oftentimes that means giving things up, leaving things behind, finding a new circle of friends. And yet, Lord, that call is as strong today as ever. We know that when we step out in faith, when we trust your promises, that you are there, Lord, and that your promises are true, and that your word is shows us over and over your faithfulness toward your people. Lord, for this number of persons that we read their names week after week, Lord, sometimes for months on end, we know that they have very real needs, that their bodies are sick, that they're facing struggles in their life. Lord, that their mental state is less than what they would hope for that there's brokenness in their families and in their lives. God, you who know all things, we ask that the power of your Spirit be poured out on these people, that they would receive healing, wholeness, peace, that their relationships would be restored. God, that they would find hope in, in the sure and certain knowledge that you are with them and that you are for them that you have called them by name, that they are yours. Holy God, we pray for those in our community, maybe even people hearing my voice in this moment, people who don't know Jesus, who haven't experienced that transformative power of a relationship with Almighty God. Lord, we pray that your spirit be at work in those lives. We pray that you would draw the people in this community that you have called to this place. Lord, that they would enter these doors and experience this vibrant faith community for themselves. Lord, we often have moments in our lives, crises, problems, challenges that are so deep and personal that we can't even speak them out loud or even write them down. But you know them, Lord. You saw every hand that was raised. You know the concern of every heart. 
And we pray today alongside them, with them, Lord, that you would address those concerns of their hearts. God, we are grateful for all that you are, for who that you are, and what you have done in our lives. We, the children of God, offer the prayer Jesus teaches us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Could I ask for our ushers to come forward at this time? generosity makes everything that goes on inside of this building, salaries, utilities, maintenance, you make all that possible. But further than that, your giving shows a grateful heart and, and a, a willingness to reach out beyond this walls, these walls and into our community. Thank you for your continued support of the mission and ministry of Marvel United Methodist Church and the United Methodist Church. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we who are many come together in this moment as one, offering those gifts that you have blessed each of us with, Lord, because we understand that we are blessed in order to be a blessing. We offer you these gifts with gratitude, asking that you would take them, that you would use them for the glory of your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
You may be seated. Today's our second installment in our series in Genesis, our final sermon series together, Learning to Trust the Story. Last week we looked at Genesis 1, where God created all things, this beautiful piece of poetry, of which a skillful writer prepared for us. Today we read some additional parts of the story. And today's reading comes to us from Genesis 11, verses 27 through 32, and Genesis 12, verse, verses 1 through 9. Hear these words. This is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Eskah. Now Sarah was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter in law Sarah, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the side of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, the understanding, and the living out of this word that we share. Let me set the context for us so we'll know where we are located in the biblical narrative. We all know that in Genesis 8 through 10, we hear the story of Noah, where God repents of having created mankind in the first place and determines to destroy all of humanity, save Noah and his family, off the face of the earth. And, the, and so the flood comes and destroys everything, and God starts over with Noah. Noah proves to God that he is not going to be the solution to the problem of humanity because the first thing Noah does is plants a vineyard and becomes drunk on the fruit of that vineyard. Sin has not died with the balance of humanity. It still lives and resides deep in the human heart as Noah proves for This lineage that we just talked of, of Nahor, shows how Abram descends from Noah's son, Shem. Some people in Judaism pronounce it Shem, but that's a little too much for me. So, we see this genealogy, and we hear about um, Terah's son, um, Haran, who has three children, and who's listed as the third child, so that typically means that he's the youngest child. So the youngest child apparently has children before the older two sons. Abram's the senior son. He's numero uno. 
So it's kind of odd that we would see the youngest son having children first, and then he dies in the place of his birth, Ur of the Chaldeans, and he leaves behind his son Lot, Lot his daughter Iska, and his daughter Milka. Now, something happens that we might find a little objectionable in our, in our middle, our, our western sensibilities. Abram and his brother Nahor married their nieces. And you go, well, one of the nieces' name was Iska, and Abram marries Sarah. And there was some confusion on that point. And, and the biblical writer put that in the text for a specific reason. To draw our attention to the fact that, that things aren't just right. You, but our Western eyes often just read past that and we go, oh well, we don't know who this Iska chick was. But Iska in Chaldean, the place of her birth, means my princess. Sarah in Aramaic, the place where Abram and Sarah went, means my princess. These are two, two names of the same person. And we're told in this story a very kind of awkward thing that, that Sarah is barren. She can't bear children. And apparently this was widely known in, in this family unit. And it's very likely because this, this young lady or older lady, she's the senior of the two, never had her first menstrual cycle. She was unable to bear children. And so it's odd to me to think of Abram as the eldest son, the person who would have had the ability to make to have first choice. That's how things work, ladies. I'm sorry. This seems to be a loveless union, but it really is not. These women have no standing outside of their the standing of their husband or their father. And they have no status in, in a patriarchal society. And what they need is someone who will provide protect them, provide for them, and offer them dignity. And that's exactly what Abram and Nahor do. They marry their nieces. It's not an uncommon practice to marry in your clan, but because they're in a place that was not the place of their birth, they marry these women. And Abram makes this choice of the woman that he knows is barren, knowing that he is not going to have children that he is not going to have progeny, that his line is going to end when he passes into the next life. And so this is a very, um, it's a very unusual choice for the elder brother because usually that's how the descendants are counted. Through that genealogy, if you read the whole substantial thing, you'll see it's, it's eldest son to eldest son. Abram chooses the needs of another person places them foremost in his thinking over his own needs, over his own wants. And God looks at the sacrifice that this person made and says, I can work with this. I can partner with this person. This is somebody I think is, is a worthwhile human being. They've shown some very altruistic traits. And so God speaks to Abraham. Abram is living in Haran with his father and his extended family. Um, apparently, Nahor and Milka stay back in Ur of the Chaldeans, and, and Abram travels with his father. Tradition has it that Abram's father was an idol maker. Maybe that's why he stops in Haran. He sees there's money to be made, there's business to do. And tradition also has it that one day, that Abram goes into his father's idol-making shop after, after everyone's asleep, and he takes an axe and he destroys every idol in the room, save one. Then he places the axe in the hands of that idol. His father, hearing the commotion, gets up and stumbles in, rubbing the sleep out of his eyes and asking his eldest son, who stands there, what's happened? And Abram looks at his father and says, well, it's very apparent what happened, Father. This idol here was mad at all the rest and destroyed him with his axe. It's in his hand. And his father slaps his head and says, Abram, these are just statues of wood and stone. I carved them myself. They can't move or breathe or destroy one another. They're just 
lifeless pieces of wood and stone. And Abram looks at his father and asks, why do you bow down to them? Again, God sees in this person someone he can work with. And so he calls Abram to leave. And, and this is, let me, let me help you understand. In Middle Eastern culture, this is almost like the prodigal son. This is like taking your stuff and leaving the father high and dry. Um, you, when a father has his family business, you stay there and you work with the family business. If it's a farm, you farm. If it's cattle, you raise cattle. But you do whatever it is to follow the, the father's calling, and that's how you inherit, is by working at the father's trade. And so Abram is doing something very unconventional. He hears a God speak to him, and at this point, if I read the text right, he doesn't even know who this God is. But he hears this, and it's very real to him. And he picks up stakes, and along with his nephew Lot and his wife Sarah and all of their property, their chattels and goods and servants, and they leave for this place that God hasn't even told them where it is yet. Pretty crazy, don't you think? To hear a call from God... A God you don't even know, a God you've never even worshipped, and yet you're willing to leave everything behind and, and follow this calling. And I don't see anywhere in this text where they had a family meeting and, and Abram says to Sarah, what do you think, honey? I don't hear anything like that. I don't hear Lot being drawn into the conversation. It's like Abram has this, he has this calling he gets up, he says, pack the stuff, we're leaving. Everybody packs up, and they're, they're like, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? We've only ever been with, with your father. Why would we leave the family business? And Abram, he journeys to this place that God has yet to tell him where. He goes to Canaan. And God makes some promises to Abram. He promises him three things. He promises him a place. He promises him a purpose, a job. And he promises him a people. This is, this is like completely not in keeping with everything that Abram knows. He's, he's left the gods of his father. He's left his father's home. It's a very much like being a Methodist preacher. You have a calling and you come to a place and you put down roots and you make friends and you love people and you thrive and you do the work and you do the ministry because that's what God's called you to do. And then one day, a calling comes. And you pack your things and you give things away. And you load them on a trailer and you haul them to the next place. That's what we do. Miss Penny, God bless her, has done this now four or five times. It has been a stressful time for her each and every time because it's always hard to leave people that you love in a place that you know. And her career follows mine because she said a long time ago before we ever entered the ministry, if this is what God called you to do, I'll be right there by your side. And thanks be to God, she's been there with me every time because we have roles to play in my house. She packs and I'll haul. This time I've tried to give away as much as I could so there's not as much to pack at all. And so Abram, he does something really odd. And, and, and I want to take you back to the first part of chapter 11, last part of chapter 10, first part of chapter 11, where after the flood, everybody has a common language on the earth and they begin to build this tower in the sky. And the text tells us to make a name for themselves. And that's one of the things... That God promises him, oh, you're going to have a great name, Abram. And when Abram goes to Canaan, the first thing he does is something very surprising. He doesn't build a building. He doesn't build a house. He doesn't buy property. He doesn't put down roots. It says he builds an altar. And there he calls on the name of the Lord. His life is about making the name of God known far and wide. And, and I want to remind you something that we hear all the time and, and something that God said to Abram in this text. You're going to be blessed to be a blessing. You are blessed not just to commiserate with the community of the blessed. 
This is this is the place where we come. This is our um, this is our Tesla charging station. Okay, we pulled off the side of the highway of life, and we plugged in, and we're getting a full charge so that we can go out and do the things that we need to do in the coming week. We've been blessed not so that we can share our faith here, but so that we can build our faith here and go outside of these doors and share our faith with the world. You have been blessed to be a blessing. We know in our Christian worldview, our Christian understanding, that the fullness of God's promise came to us as people who are not Jewish through Jesus Christ, through his life, death, and resurrection. We know Jesus is our Savior, the Son of God. And there are people out there in each of our spheres of influence that don't know Jesus. They don't know him. They've never met him. They've never darkened the doors of the church. They were like I was until I was about 10 years old. I never, I never been to church until I was 10 years old. I, I never heard of a hymn or heard a sermon. I, I knew there was something going on, and those people seemed to be pretty dedicated because they came at certain times every week, certain days at times, and it just it just felt something about that was attractive to me. I, I know that is God at work in my life, even as a small child, because every one of us have a God-sized hole in our life. People, people of God, you are blessed to be a blessing. There are people out there with little to no hope, people who need, who need something to drink, something to eat, a place to stay, a little hope in their lives. They need to know that somebody cares about them. They need to experience the love of God in Christ that you and only you can provide. I pray today that each one of you understands if you have a call, you are part of the priesthood of all believers. That's what Paul tells us. We all have a calling. Your calling may not be to pack up everything you own and move to Magnolia, but maybe it's to do what you can do right here where God has placed you. That you can do all that you can in order that other people might know Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, you've called us. You've called us by name. We are yours. We are people of your pastor. She, you are our shepherd. Lord, all that we have is yours. Our lives, our homes, the resources you bless us with. Help us, oh God, to open our hearts and our hands to be a blessing to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have an invitation. Just pass me a knock with General Savior, number 354. <laughs>
was not a perfect man. He was a good man, but during the course of his story, he gave his wife to two kings on two separate occasions without ever speaking up. He sent his son Ishmael and Ishmael's mother Hagar out into the desert into certain death. He almost sacrificed the son of the promise on an altar according to what God had spoken to him. He was far less than a perfect person. But he was open to an ongoing relationship with God. If you hear the words today, if God is speaking to your heart, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I hope that you come and talk with me following today's service. If you're not a member of this local congregation, we would love to have you become a part of what is going on here at Marvel United Methodist Church. Today, I want to bless you in order that you might go out and be a blessing. I pray that you have heard the words that we've shared, that they are planted deeply in your heart, and that you go from this place to share the love of God in Christ. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen.